everyone. How's your day going? Good. Good. Have you seen Breathe, by the way? Have you been able to see it? Isn't it beautiful? It's really beautiful. Um, I'm Stacey Wilson-Hunt from New York Magazine. I'm the Hollywood editor here in LA, and I'm so honored to be here to speak to an actor whom I greatly admire and is just as charming and lovely as he appears to be, which is rare, as you guys know. Um, <laughs> so let me welcome to the stage Andrew Garfield. Hello again. <laughs> how, how does it, when you see the, the teaser and for the movie and you hear him speaking about you in that way and, and knowing how happy he is that you really captured his father's spirit, how does that make you feel? I try not to listen. I, I try not to look. I try not to listen. Is it just overwhelming? Um, well, no, I, goodness, it's, um, yes, because I just feel lucky that I get to act. I feel lucky that I get to to do it at all, let alone do, do I get to, to do it in, in, in projects that I believe in, that are very rich. And then, and then for, 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 for people that matter to me to, to tell me that it was, it was all right, it's, uh, whew, it's hard. I find it, <laughs> it's a hard life. Uh, no, it's, it's, I, find it, I, find it, I find it overwhelming and, uh, because I, I just feel um, abundantly lucky to get to get to do what I do. But yeah, so for Jonathan to say that, um, who's a remarkable man unto himself, and uh, absolutely his father's son, mm. um, who, who shares all of the qualities that, that Robin has, the character I play has, to hear that is, um, yeah, it's, it's reassuring, kind of, you, you, to, to know that you haven't screwed up the life of someone that you, that you care about very much. Right. Right. Well, you certainly didn't. Well. <laughs> you thrived. Yeah. Um, so backstage, we were talking about um, the last 10 years for you have been pretty packed, mm. very impressive. I feel like you're the only actor who, for his first 10 years making films that we've been seeing in America, you've been nominated for an Oscar, you've headlined a superhero franchise, and you've been directed by Martin Scorsese in a relatively short period. Um, those are all, I don't think Leo did that. Just not that we're keeping right. score, I'm just saying. Right. He's no, no, it's important. <laughs> it's important to note that. Yeah, it no. is. <laughs> it's an impressive run. It's an impressive run. Um, but I, I would love to start with the fact that you were born in Los Angeles. Yes, and yes. Tell, tell me how that came to be. Yeah, well, uh, well, my... <laughs> how much detail do you want? Uh, Not I was, the day of the birth, necessarily, but just, you well, know, I was the circumstances. Uh, well, the circumstances of my parents' lovemaking. Uh, I, was, um, I was conceived in New York City, actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was a, a balmy spring evening at all. <laughs> Uh, this is a true origin story day, you guys. Here's my mum and dad right now. Um, they will demonstrate. Uh, no. Sorry. Oh, no. We need this, you guys. This is very cathartic. Oh, it's dreadful. I, this is good. Um, no, so, yeah, anyway, I was conceived in New York. And then uh, my father's American. My, my, my dad was, uh, they, his family were Polish immigrants um, during, just before the, 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 the Nazis did all their terrible things. Um, they, they managed to get out and uh, they went to Los Angeles first and some of them went to New York and then, yeah, my, my, my dad's family wanted to be closer to their European relatives again when it was, of course, safe to go back. And uh, so they, they, they moved back to London. Uh, mm. But then it had the, uh, the adverse effect on my father where he decided he, 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 he wanted to be secular. He didn't want to be Jewish. He, well, no, he, not that he didn't want, he can't say I'm not Jewish anymore. Right, so I just right. don't practice. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, so that, that was an interesting thing. But anyway, he, he, was, he was dragged away kicking and screaming from, mm. from Los Angeles at the age of 12 because oh, the wow. Beach Boys were, were here and the surf culture that was just kind of getting going here. And he was absolutely obsessed with all those things. And he mm. loved the sunshine. He loved, he loved films. He loved movies. I think if he had stayed here, mm. I probably wouldn't be here now <laughs> in the sense that he probably maybe might have lived out his primary dream, which was to be a screenwriter. Uh, if he had stayed, and, I, and and if he had done that, I wouldn't have had his his dream to live out for him in a, in a way. <laughs> oh, so so I owe I owe him a great deal, and I, and I got to to bring him to the Oscars last year, oh. and and that was um, one of uh, the mo great moments of both of our lives together. Because he w he he ended up moving back to to LA when he met my mum, right. and he had a uh, 
a, a, a shipping business, a, a moving company, mm. and he he would drive past the, all the studios, especially Fox for some reason, um, and he would romanticize and imagine what was going on oh inside um, behind those gates. So I got to take him uh, for the first time into Fox the day before the Oscars, and he he cried as he as he as he passed the threshold, <laughs> and uh, it was just you know because he's he's in his late sixties now, and he, so he's. He's in the, th the third act of his life, and uh, and he's just started writing oh, wow. um, now because he's, he's he sacrificed so much um, for for all of our family, um, but I think it had the the most profound effect on me. It, me it meant that I could you know be an idiot for a living <laughs> and uh, and tell stories and be uh, a clown and get lost and and uh, yeah be here with you all. So I, I, I owe him a, a great deal. And you moved back to the UK when you were three. Yeah. And do you have memories at all of your of early, Angeles. yeah. Do you have glimpses? Or yeah, I have, a, I have like a, a sensory, mem I have sensory memory of, of the feeling of being here. So when I come back here, I, I, I actually do love it. And just mm. in terms of the weather and, and the space and the sky and the blueness of the sky. And so yeah, it was like the, f the first three years of my life were probably the happiest <laughs> years of my life. <laughs> Because I was getting fed, and <laughs> I didn't have any acting responsibilities. I, uh, I I didn't have to, you know, make coherent sense <laughs> sentences, and I was just, you know, I was I was out, you know, in nature with my with my mum and my brother, and uh, yeah. So no, I, but but no, I, Disneyland. I remember Disneyland. I have one. I have one traumatic memory of Disney. Disney. <laughs> I think which, we all uh, do. It's a scary place when you're younger. Yeah, yeah mine wasn't. As, it wasn't because it was scary for me. Unfortunately, is this it's, the it's more a, recent one? No, 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 oh, okay. no, 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 okay. no. No, this, this, this was a. This was my first brush with ego. I think when I was th th Ooh, two and a half, <laughs> and my brother, who's older than me, he um, he had won this light up hat, one of those one of those visors, you know, one of those kind of visors, and it had like lights on it, and he had won it. He had won it by winning a, a competition, and I, I said, well, I want one of those. I would like one of those, please, as well. <laughs> and, um, and, the, and the I was like, well, no, I mean, like, you, have to, you have to play the game. So I played the game. I didn't win it because I was two and a half, and he was five. Uh, this is where the dynamic with my brother began, and uh, the, the hatred between us. And, um, and he, um, so I, I couldn't win the game, and, I, and they gave me like a, a kind of runner-up visor, which, was, which had no lights, and uh, was... <laughs> was made merely out of cotton, and, um, and I threw a hissy fit. I, I lost my mind. I was like, wailing and screaming, and that's when I understood that life was, in fact, unfair. And, uh, <laughs> it was a, a defining moment. It's a moment. great lesson to learn that young, though. Yeah, yeah. Some people I'm still, still learning it. I'm still, I'm still not in acceptance of reality as it is. That visor, I will one day get that visor. <laughs> So when you went back to the UK, it seemed like you were very athletic. You were into sports. Yeah. Did you see sports as more of a conduit for your passions before acting, or were they sort of simultaneous? I don't know, really. I didn't, I didn't know about acting. I knew about films, and I, I watched films when I was a kid. My dad, of course, you know, he was a cinephile, and, but, and we, we would rent every movie in the local movie, movie store, and, uh, and, and, then we, and then the blockbuster came to, to, <laughs> to blockbuster video came to Sutton, where we, near, nearby where we lived, this little town of, in, in Surrey where we lived. And um, so me and my, we would just get it. We would consume Consume everything, and and especially you know '80s films, anything with Tom Hanks in it, like The Burbs, or uh, you know any of those obscure. Joe versus the Volcano was a family favorite, and uh, all Michael J. Fox movies, and uh, Richard Pryor movies, and Gene Wilder, uh, all that stuff. So but comedy, so, definitely a lot of comedy. Yeah, a lot okay. of comedy, a lot of like funny and John Candy films, yeah. and um, but then. So in terms of the sport, I mean, I didn't know acting was a job. I just thought, oh, these are the, 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 these are the things that, that uh, you know, the, the movies gave me so much reassurance and like everyone else, you know, I, 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 I would have died without films, I think. Mm. Um, and, then, and then I started, uh, I was just very, f I was just a, I, I had a lot of energy and I was like just a monkey child <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, I, and I was annoying as hell <laughs> and, I, and it, it needed to go somewhere and right. so we, we found, I decided doing gymnastics and swimming and, and rugby and football and cricket and, and, and just everything really. And, uh, but then something happened where, I, and I can't, it's a mystery, I can't quite explain, 
but it, it, I let it go of it all. I like stopped everything. I started, I think, secondary school, high school, and academia didn't wasn't there was nothing hooking me in um, in, in academia in um, in any of my school subjects. Had you been a good student until I was a, I was I could, I was I was diligent. I would uh, I would work hard even if I didn't um, even if I didn't uh, you know care so much about what I was doing because because of, of my dad he was he was actually a swimming coach. He turned out, it turned out to be a really great swimming coach. So he gave me. The, lot of discipline, which is a, a blessing and a, a horrible, horrible <laughs> curse, um, because it means I never stop working and I, and I get obsessive about things. And I know that there's never any end to what one can do, especially in the arts. You know, it's you're never going to create the perfect thing. It's always um, it's always unreachable. That's the beauty, the, the divine dissatisfaction. I think is what Martha Graham <laughs> said about the artist that we're we're all just you know, these divinely dissatisfied creatures. Um, which I rings so so true, but anyhow, um, I let it all fall away. I let all the sport, all everything fall away. I I, I I probably was depressed. I was definitely lost. I definitely didn't know why I was alive. <laughs> I didn't know what we were doing here. None of it made sense. Mm. And uh, but I cleared the space in order to feel that I think so that what needed to come in could so come. So sports in. wasn't the outlet you necessarily needed. It was more of an ex you needed something more expressive. But also I was too small. That was a, a, a blessing. <laughs> to, to like, that was a, a horrible thing at the time, but in retrospect, it was it was exactly what I needed to let it all go. I kept getting con concussed during yeah. rugby. I kept getting very cold during swimming. <laughs> I kept, I kept, I kept, I kept, I kept, Which is reasonable. Yeah, and and like and 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 you know it didn't. Um, and, and oh, and there was a big fat guy that would sit on my back while I was doing the splits in gymnastics, and I thought this is abuse. And uh, <laughs> I, when I was like 13, that so is actually it, literally abuse. It was. Did someone it was. Stop that? But no, I mean that's what uh, makes Olympians, I guess. Um, <laughs> I just I wasn't cut out for it. Um, but then so so I but I let it all fall fall away, and but thankfully I did because then you know my mother came in and saved the day. She said, what about something creative? And I said, well, oh, okay. So I tried painting, <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> I, tried, I, I like this is your painting. <laughs> <laughs> rubbish. I tried sculpture, <laughs> rubbish. I tried, uh, I tried music, <laughs> rubbish. I tried, uh, you know, I tried all the, all, of the, all of the things. And then she was like, well, what about, what about theater and, and acting? And I said, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? <laughs> because I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't you know. You didn't associate the burbs, the movies no, you'd seen I with didn't. theater. It, it felt out of, it didn't feel possible. It didn't, it felt totally out of reach. So then, of course, you know, I tried it. And uh, yeah, theater. And what was the f very first role you played? Fat Sam and Bugsy Malone. <laughs> And uh, at the great. Epsom Playhouse, yeah, when I was, I think, 15. And it was just, yeah, it was bliss. Have you ever seen Bugsy Malone? I mean, it's like little kids playing gangsters. It's the most absurd. Some people have, right? <laughs> it's an Alan Parker movie, yeah. Yeah, it was Jodie Foster. And, Jodie yeah. Foster, far too young to be sexualized, <laughs> but she's... She had already done that, I think, before. Well, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Even, but even more so, I mean, this was loss of innocence, like, yeah. crazy. But, um, yeah, it's an amazing movie, though. Uh, Scott Bio. Yeah. It was wonderful. Uh, yeah, great songs, and Alan Park is such a great director. Anyway, so so yeah, and that was my favorite, one of my favorite films growing up. And and then so and they, they asked me to play Fat Sam, which I thought was, I don't know, stretching me is good. It was, uh, and then you were uh, too thin for sports, but perfect for Fat Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And my dad still says everything he sees that I do. He says, "Well, it's no, it's no Fat Sam. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right." Parents, parents say things like that. Yeah. So uh, I want to make sure we get to a lot of your roles, which are so plentiful that we're going to have to move very quickly. I but told you I ramble. <laughs> you did. You warned me. But I'm going to be here to like cut you off okay, when please. I need to. Okay, please. Yeah, please. So the first thing I saw you in was in 2007 in Lions for Lambs. Oh, yeah. Which was directed by Robert Redford, starring some unknown people named Tom Cruise, Meryl Streep, and also Robert Redford. <laughs> so this is your American debut. And yeah. what the hell did it feel like to be working with these people <laughs> yeah. in your first American movie? I mean, you, you, you just said it, it, like, what do you do with that? Like, how, <laughs> how do you reconcile that being your first film? And then where do you go? <laughs> and then you just quit. Um, it, was, uh, it was remarkable and so bizarre. Um, but Redford, if any, I don't know if anyone knows him, work with him or... Bob, of course. Yeah. Bobby. We're close. It's Bob. <laughs> it's just Bob. Um, 
I also call Martin Scorsese Marty. That, of course that's you do. That's odd. Um, <laughs> well, you've earned the right to do that because well, you've worked with anyone him. earlier. He's, he puts everyone at ease immediately. It's it's a strange thing meeting those people and kind of realizing, just realizing that they are as fucked up as you are. <laughs> 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 it's so so great. It's very oh. assuring, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's the best. It's the best. All this illusion bullshit. That's also a good lesson to learn early on. Yeah, too. yeah. But yeah. but I will say this about about Redford is that he, um, I don't know, he he was incredibly inspiring. Mm. His his ethos about the world, his way of seeing the world, how he started Sundance. Oh, amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. He 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 started it because his his he he bought property in Utah and his he was introducing himself to a, to a neighbor and. The guy was like, well, I'm about to be bought out by this, so this multinational company. They're buying my land. I can't afford to keep it. And he was like, well, how much do you need? He's like, this amount. I was like, OK, well, I can probably stump you that amount. But we have to figure out a way to make some of it back together. And then they started the, the labs. They started uh, monetizing uh, the, the labs in, in Sundance. And then from the, of course, I mean, but how, what a beautiful impulse. Amazing. And that really sums him up. Uh, and what's, um, obviously you've worked with Mel Gibson too. Mm. What are the distinct differences you see in being directed by actors? Like mm. Robert and... Mel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or is there a distinction? Well, I mean, I, I, you talk about Scorsese as well because I think it's, it's generational. If, from my experience so far, it's been a, it's the, there's a definite generational divide. You know, Scorsese and Redford and, and, uh, and, and Mel will... They'll, they'll more often than not be next to the camera looking, looking at what's happening live. Mm. They'll make sure that the framing's all right and then, then they'll make sure that, that it looks the way that he, they want it to look. But, uh, and especially Scorsese, is, you know, he's a master at, at composition and all of that. But then um, they really, they're just, they, are, they know that the scene doesn't exist unless there's life. You know, uh, I think Sidney Lumet was the same way. You know, he's one of my favorite filmmakers of, of all time. You think they're harder on actors than maybe more contemporary directors? I think that there's a disconnect with more, with certain contemporary. I'm, I mean, I'm painting large brushstrokes, but I think there's a much more technical wizardry that that mm -hmm. contemporary directors have access to because of you know the developments in technology. Um, and I would say that sometimes, occasionally, not all the time, that can. Um, be a little bit out of balance with an understanding of emotional life. Um, well, when those guys came of age in the 70s, I mean, those movies were really just about the performances. Yeah, it was all you about You didn't have a ton human. of money to add in, yeah. <laughs> fix it in post. No, I mean, right, Really, exactly. all you had were those incredible performances. Yeah, and that's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in the humanity of, you know, the, all those movies from the 70s especially, you know. The, the, I'm, that's, that's what turns me on as an, as an actor now. On day afternoon. Yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah, and Network and, you know, all of Sidney Lumet's movies, really. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, Scorsese's films from that era and... So yeah, as an actor, those are the for me. Those are the and and you know there are there are great directors like Paul Thomas Anderson, of course, mm -hmm. is someone who is feels akin to and you know Bennett Miller and right. and those those and Spike Jones and you know the, these proper proper visionaries who are still in touch with humanity. And all started out making indies too. Yeah, and Fincher as well. You know, oh, actually started out in the commercial world in a you know in a crazy way. But they were, but they're they were just on the cusp. It feels like between the newest generation and the and those and those filmmakers from the seventies. It feels like there's a real um, yeah. And I and I had this and I know you'll probably talk about it. But I had this amazing moment where I got to work with Mark Romanek, mm. and then Spike. Mm. And then Fincher, all back to back. Those like those classic music video, the guys who created right. music videos, and Spike is like someone who I idolize. I've idolized since I even before I even knew he existed. Like when I watched skate videos, right. I didn't know he had directed the skate videos that I was consuming because I used to right. skateboard in, in, in London. That, that's that was what I was doing when I was lost. I was skating <laughs> around. I was skating around London yeah. and breaking bones and kind of like moping um, <laughs> in, in clothes that were too big for me. Um, so no, and then so so Spike. So anyway, it was that that was that period of time was remarkable. Mm. Yeah, he came of age in a very cool way, very distinct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I had, when I was reviewing all your work, I had forgotten that you were in Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, mm. um, which was obviously a very troubled experience because of Heath mm. Ledger passing away during production. Um, what was it like working with Terry Gilliam? And were you a Monty Python guy before? Yeah. Like, what is that experience like? <laughs> he's lunatic. Yeah. He's, yeah. I mean, I um, assume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he's crazy. Um, 
in the best in that in that creative genius way. You know, he's uncompromising to the point of you know, you know, kind of uh, irresponsibility sometimes. But uh, it's wonderful to be around. And we had Tom Waits on that, which was crazy. That cast is just oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. And Christopher Plummer, of course. And yeah, it was um, and that was an amazing experience. And then. And 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 yeah, so so t yeah, t I'm, and he just made Don Quixote, Terry. Okay. He just finally finished the. Fine, that was a long. <laughs> <laughs> was in gestation for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that great documentary, Lost in La Mancha. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys have seen mm -hmm. it. It's such a great film. Um, but yeah, so no, Terry is Terry is amazing. Terry, all freedom. In it's totally. He, he said to me, you know, he said, just do, just don't think. Don't, don't think about what you're doing, don't watch what you're doing, don't worry about what you're doing, yeah. and trust that I'm only gonna use the bits that make me laugh. Mm. Yeah. And all the rest, it will be on the cutting room, all the crap bits will be on the cu cutting room floor. <laughs> he was like, I wanna see crap, I wanna see you fail, I wanna see you fall over and be terrible. Did he let you guys do improv? I mean, yes. you had so many great comic moments. And, yeah. Yeah, 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 it was a lot, it was a lot of improv actually, uh, mm. which I, I didn't expect to be. Mm. That, was the, I think that was my first time doing improv on a film set. Hmm. Yeah. And, and did you get to know Heath at all? A little bit, that, yeah. yeah, a little bit. Um, I admired him so much as an actor and as a spirit and as a creature. He was, uh, he was one of those very uh, oh, unbridled spirits. Hmm. I don't know if you ever met him. He seemed like it. Yeah, uh, and yeah, there's some, uh, what do you say? <laughs> What do you say? He really had it. I mean, it was a natural. Yeah, there, but even beyond even that, even yeah. beyond that, he wasn't of this world. He, yeah. he wasn't of this world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so over the weekend, I was rewatching Never Let Me Go, which mm. was, I saw at the time, and you know, movies get lost in the shuffle, and yeah. then you sort of want to revisit. And, and seeing you among all these people, including Carrie Mulligan, yes. Kira, Domo Gleason, Andre Riceborough. It was sort of like this incredible generation of young actors who all sort of came of age. And Kira had been around a little bit before little that, bit. but- and Yeah, Kira had done a lot. Yeah, yeah, at that point she'd, you know, she'd been working for a long time. Yeah. But to see this amazing group of people and to see where all of you are now, mm -hmm. it's, what was it like to sort of bond with each other at this crucial moment when you're all kind of on the cusp? Well, you're definitely not aware of anything like right. that, but you know, I mean, that, that journalist context <laughs> thing is a, is a gift that you have. But but it's, it's all in uh, hindsight too. Yeah, now sure. we know you were on the cusp. But no, it, it was uh, all I can talk about is working on that story and th with those with story. those themes. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Kazuo just got the the Nobel Prize, the yeah. Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. the Nobel Prize. Yeah, for for literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for <laughs> not, yeah, for he wrote not, not Remains peace. of the Day yeah. and um, was it Howard Zen too? How is, uh, did you I should know this. Yes, I should too, but amazing novelist. Yeah, amazing and The Berry Giant was his most recent novel, and right. Never Let Me Go, of course. Um, it's a, just that story mm. and that book and what it's dealing with is about the essence of a soul, what it is to have a soul, right. and how do you quantify a soul. And I, and I, and I, I would pick, I, 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 like to min, I like to get things as reduced as possible so that I can understand them. So I would bother him a lot, Kazuo. And I would say, what is this? What are you, what are you doing? He was engaged a lot in the production. He, he co-wrote the script with he Alex did. Garland, okay. oh, our, right, our, yeah, our wonderful new filmmaker out of England who, <laughs> right. who, who's been chomping at the bit and finally people are seeing that he's this tremendous filmmaker in his own he's right. He's great at dystopian yes. um, content. Yes. Yeah. And he wrote The Beach and you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I would just bother Kazuo a lot and I would say, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Why is this so this? Why is this so important? And why, and why, why, do, why do you feel, why does the book feel like a slow stab in the back that you don't know is happening until the final? How did you do? He's like, well, I think I wanted to write it. I wore him down. And he I was about to say, was he annoyed with <laughs> yeah, all no, these questions? No, he's the most polite, en like English and Japanese in yeah. one. That's a polite individual. That's very yeah. polite. <laughs> 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 That's like borderline psychotic. Um, like he's got like dead bodies in the basement somewhere. With no all one that can be that, that no. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He was the, the most gentle, like, like oh, such a beautiful man. And he he eventually he eventually got worn down, and he said, uh, "Well, I think I was wondering about the meaning of life, and as far as I understand it, it's for me about love and creativity." And then and that was, and that was it. And I was like, well, that's that that that's a pretty good indication of of, of what a soul is, how we love and how we 
create, mm -hmm. whether it's art or otherwise, or home or family or connections or relationships or. So he got he got to the he got to some core thing about why we're here and what we're doing. We're also using our anatomy and our body parts mm. as sort of the the currency of our soul and kind of like that's to me sort of how I read the story was, yeah. you know, how much of us is actually our innards and yes. sort of what we can potentially give away or yeah. yeah yeah and what's disposable, and the idea of some of us being disposable. Um, because it, it didn't feel it didn't feel all that alternate reality to me, mm. you know it felt it felt very uh, symbolic of uh, the a we of, a, of a Western culture right now where the, it feels like a lot of a, a lot of people feel disposable, don't feel welcome, don't feel needed, don't feel like they matter. I would I would say that's that the the percentage of of us who feel that on a day to day basis would 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 be quite harrowing to know. Right. Uh, in terms of how we're valued and in terms of how we, um, we're welcomed here, a sense of belonging here. Uh, well, it so offers the perfect segue to a movie about Facebook, which is the social network, yes. um, which all seems so quaint now, seven years later, and you think <laughs> about, like, who is there a sequel in the works? Because there'd be <laughs> quite a lot of material to <laughs> delve into <laughs> as of late. Yeah. Maybe Aaron's working on it right Luckily, now. Luckily, the character I play is in <laughs> Singapore with his feet up Yes, he's, he is, he's he is like avoided. A, a cajillionaire <laughs> somewhere across the, the globe. So, of course, you played Eduardo Saverin. Yeah. Um, first of all, what was it like to play a real-life person? Yeah. How much time did you spend with him? And now when you look back on that movie, I mean, that movie is just stunning. I haven't seen it in mm. a couple of years, but I, I just remember it was just like electric. And what David and Aaron were able to do telling this incredibly strange story mm -hmm. was astounding. Yeah. Um, well, maybe tell me how you got the job first. Did, did you audition for David? And yeah, was it so specifically for this role? No, I auditioned, I auditioned with uh, David's casting director, Lorraine Mayfield. Wonderful casting director. And they were, I think, I don't think there were, there was no script. We didn't get seen, shown the script yet. Maybe we did, I forget. Um, but I was reading for Mark, because everyone was reading Mark scenes. Right. Or maybe not everyone was, but I was. And, I, then, and then I went in and I read f with David, just me and him. That was really interesting. And then Aaron came in, and then it was the three of us. And I read, for, I was reading for Mark. I thought, and I thought, well, because there was a scene w with a zip line where Mark was on a zip line. Oh, yeah. and, uh, I, but I think actually, ultimately, in the film, they cut that bit and they just sent one of the other guys down on the zip line into the, into the swimming pool off of the right, roof right, in Palo Alto. Right. Mm -hmm. And I read that scene, I was like, I want to do this film. <laughs> like, I just want to do this film and play that part just for that scene so I can zip line <laughs> over and over again into a swimming pool. This is what my life work has been <laughs> going towards. This is my reason to be here. Um, not because it was a great part and because, you know, whatever. David Fincher, Aaron Sorkin. It's like a zip you still line. had a lot of energy to get out. Yeah, yeah exactly. I needed <laughs> yeah. a zip line. Um, and uh, so I was reading for Mark Zuckerberg and, uh, and then I read for Aaron and David and it felt like one of those meetings where, where <laughs> it's one of those meetings where you go, I fucking nailed that shit. <laughs> which are rare, which are so rare. But working with Aaron's language, it's so hard not to feel like you've nailed it. But I could feel like I think he he like stood up at one point Aaron. after after one of my like reads. Mm -hmm. He kind of stood up and like turned around and, and and then like as I was leaving, I think David said I told you to him. And I was wow. like, okay, it's f we're good, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, and I Famous never feel that. Words, right? I never feel confident. <laughs> I never feel any any time in my life. <laughs> and it was just in that moment, I was like, okay, that went well. I did my best, and it and, it's, and they they liked that, and that's nice. And then um, <laughs> and then I got a call from David. Uh, I was hearing that it was all happening. So this is all, before Jesse was even in the conversation. I didn't know who Jesse okay. Eisenberg was. Okay. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All I keep hearing from my agents is, it's looking really good. We're just waiting on the official thing. They it's love looking saying that really too. They good. love it, right? No, but they actually don't. My guys, <laughs> my my agents are very like they they know how neurotic I am, and they don't like dangling carrots. Okay, that's good. So because so <laughs> because they know I'm banging my head against the wall. Um, and he so 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 it kept happening, and, it was, and then I got and it was just dating. It was longer and longer and longer, and I was like, oh. Dear, what's going on? Something's <laughs> not right. Right. And um, and then I got a call saying David wants to speak to you. I was like, oh, this is where he breaks the news. <laughs> it's, not, it's not going my way. <clears throat> and then I got to his office and he said, look, I have two actors 
and one of them is perfect for Mark, and one of them could play Mark, but is kind of perfect for this other thing. And I said, just give me any part, I don't fucking care, just, <laughs> I just want to do this film. And then so he gave me, he said, well, would you like to, to do Eduardo? Go and think about it, go and think about it. It was very sweet of him to say that, even though I didn't need to think about it at no. all. Like, I, was, I, would have, I would have done craft services, you know. I, I would, <laughs> I, it, you know, that script is one of the greatest film scripts I think ever written. Yeah. Um, it actually was shot pretty much what Aaron wrote. Word for word, yeah. word for word, change, mostly, which is yeah. very rare. Yeah, very rare. And, and especially for David Fincher, who's a, you know, controlling I know, the sort of Fincher, anyway. Sorkin, that could have gone another way because they are so fastidious and so detailed. I have no idea how they didn't kill each other. <laughs> but, they, but it was the most symbiotic, like, perfect, his, David's eye, David's sense of the character, because David really, really got Mark yeah. as he was written. And also, Sorkin's been writing Mark characters his whole career. Right. It's finally like that, there was enough dialogue to finally satisfy <laughs> one <laughs> central character. Yeah, and it wasn't excessive dialogue. Right. It was like absolutely enough right. and right. Um, How do you think your Mark would be different from what Jesse did? <laughs> so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Would he have had a British accent? <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesse, I fell in love with Jesse. Like, you know, that was a love story for me. Hmm. That was that was what that was. That that relationship. Between the two of them. Yeah, it was like Cain and Abel. It was like brothers for hmm. me. And and uh, for Eduardo, I think in the way it was written, and obviously for Mark, it's a different story. It's like no, right. you are needed, and then you are not needed. Right. So interesting. Um, so also, no, for Eduardo me, had to be so different from. I yeah. mean, he was sort of the counterpoint, and he, I think he was yeah. the more kind of watery heart kind of yeah. thing. The soul. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. But 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 yeah. So anyway, but no, with Jesse, you know, what Jesse did was remarkable, and I and I did. I fell in love with with Jesse as a person, as an actor, and, and as a character, and that re creating that relationship with him. And we, we, we spent Halloween together in Baltimore in a cheesecake factory, and uh, <laughs> that was uh, the best Halloween. <laughs> I think I, did, I spent the whole Halloween doing an Australian accent because he liked it. <laughs> a specific character, I think I was playing like a gay Australian filmmaker based on a filmmaker we know that was just very flamboyant. It was very, 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 very funny and Couple silly. A theatre geeks having dinner yeah, on Halloween. Yeah, and Cheesecake yeah. Factory and in cheesecake Baltimore, <laughs> of all places. Uh, yeah, um, those days, I miss those days. Uh, no, but I, and, I, and, and he's remarkable, and what he did was... What him and David did together, because David really got knew what that character. Well, and David was. brings such an ominousness, if yeah. that's a word. I mean, everything he makes, there's there's like this like scary cloud. This Even the, I mean, that movie could have been made in a very Spielbergian sort oh, of like silly. this happened and like catch me if you can, kind of buoyant and yeah. fun. And he made it like a horror movie. With that Trent Reznor score. <laughs> yeah. Spielberg and Reznor need to work together at yeah. some point. That's, yeah, that's yeah, a partnership yeah. we haven't yeah, seen. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, so we segue to when you enter the stratosphere of superherodom, mm -hmm. um, The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2. Mm. Uh, what did it feel like to find yourself in this position after yeah. others had, yeah. um, with great success as well? Mm. And were you scared to jump into this yes. after having done a lot of artistic movies and kind of existing but not in this same kind of wild presence. Yeah, I think until, until I got the part, I was just going for the part. You were, okay. That's all I wanted was to play that part. And then as soon as I got it, everything just went, okay, now we're, what, what, what? And then I think <laughs> the reality of it hit me in a, in a new way. It, 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 it took a few weeks, but then, um, you know, I'm not going to go into all the, the processes, but it, you know, even after getting the part, I, 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 I didn't read a script for like another couple of months, hmm. which was unnerving to say the least. Meaning that you were separating yourself from other opportunities. No, 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 the Spider-Man script. Oh, the actual Spider-Man yeah, script. Yeah, yeah, because you don't, you, you're not allowed to read it before, or before getting the part. And I thought, well, I, once I get the part, then they'll show it so to So was me. your audition you, you climbing up the wall? Like, how yeah, did you? Yeah, just climb <laughs> the wall, just like pretending to be Spider-Man, just like, I don't know, Peter Parker, hi, kind of whatever. Uh, no, uh, they, 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 they had written scenes, okay. and so... Kind of like dummy like, scenes for you to just yeah, sort of like... Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. But they were really good, actually. Um, um, Alvin, Alvin Sargent mm -hmm. wrote oh, them. I love yeah. Alvin. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was, of um, course, married to Laura Ziskin, Laura Ziskin, who produced the movie. She's yeah. a lovely person. Yeah, yeah. she's a wonderful, wonderful human being. 
Um, so then I didn't. So then I didn't read the script. There was no because I, I think they were still writing it. Right. And I thought, well, oh dear, what do we need a script in order to make a film? <laughs> and I, what am I? What do I? I need to learn my lines, <laughs> and I need to know what are we doing, and is it good, and is it going to be all right? So there's a lot of anxiety, and I realized that there was a, a different set of priorities that were right. happening in that kind of film. You know, they have a release date before they have a script, yes. and and um, <laughs> what? <laughs> what reality is this? <laughs> Um, well, and had you been a fan of Sam Raimi's movies with Toby? Him. Okay. Loved him. So I this was a personal yeah. thing too for you, just not wanting to be the guy who screws up the franchise. Oh my god, beyond that, like wanting to be the guy that does the definitive one. Like wanting to be the guy that is like, you know, that my heart and my, my full self could not have been more invested in, in, uh, in, that, in that character. And... Uh, I, you know, my first Halloween costume when I was three, my mother hand made it and it was Spider-Man. Um, so it's like huge to, to get given that opportunity and to, you know, what a gift. And, and, and then the reality is, is uh, the reality. You know, the fantasy is wonderful. Fantasy <laughs> is, is, uh, is, is anything you can cook up. Um, but then when you, when you get into it, when I, when I got into it, it was obviously a very complicated situation like all situations in life are um, and then so yeah it was it was really I didn't sleep during during uh, really? well I mean I, sl I not literally that would have been I would have died <laughs> <laughs> like you know, I, was, I was on like three hours a night during during, during pre-production and all the way through production yeah because because there was lots of this and lots of rewriting the night before and mm and things that weren't, because uh, there were so many different writers that came in and went and that, and this was my first experience having to rewrite things in order just to create some logic right. in terms of the character's journey. Uh, and I mean, you know, Mark, Mark, Mark Webb is a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker and a wonderful man. He, you know, we were scrambling. Because he had come from 500 Days of Summer. Yeah. He had never done something of this scale before. No. Yeah. Um, so, so, so we, we, we really, you know, it was, everyone was working their, their asses off, as it mm. were. And, and, and uh, when you're making a movie like that, when there's so, you know, so many special effects <coughs> and you're not, this is not like a cohesive narrative you're shooting, it's obviously you're shooting yeah. certain yeah. scenes out of sequence. Mm. I mean, do you even have a sense of if it's going to be good when you're shooting it or you just have no idea? No idea. I knew, I knew that, um, I knew that, <laughs> I knew that me and Emma were getting along, and I knew that. Uh, <laughs> and I knew. <laughs> well, no, I you did. Had excellent like, chemistry. Yes, no, I knew. I knew yeah. that, and I knew that th those scenes were going to work. I knew that uh, you know she's remarkable as an actor and as a human being, and and I knew that that was going to be okay. Um, and uh, but otherwise, it was kind of. And I knew that, and me and Sally got along really, and me and Reese got along. I knew I got along with all the actors really well, and I. <clears throat> That, that journey between mine and Emma's character was very cohesive and was, as was mine between s m mine and, s and Aunt May, Sally's character, that felt very cohesive. We figured out a, a nice through line. Other stuff just felt, it was, you know, it's just tricky. It's just, you know, it's tricky. It's right. tricky. And, and, and what is it like to promote a movie like this? I mean, <laughs> like we were talking backstage, you've been promoting, <laughs> you've been promoting this movie Breathe, which is, a smaller scale experience, <laughs> yeah. but I, I get so exhausted when I see like the, the, you know, the premiere in China. I mean, you're traveling the globe, you're yeah. doing junket after junket. I mean, yeah. how long did that take to actually roll this movie out beginning oh. to end? Was oh, I it don't just remember. like six months? It was, it was like being in a time warp. It, it didn't, it, it, it's, uh, again, it's a very strange thing now yeah. because, especially with those films, um, where the priorities are different. And uh, you know, there's more money in the publicity tour than there is on on the screen in, in certain certain regards, and that's, I mean, it's a business, right? It's an economy, and 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 w th th we have to they have to be able to make money to keep making films. So I, I get it. It's uh, it's it's I, I find it quite hard being an actor of of, of that happens to be alive now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, going back, harking back to actors from the 70s mm -hmm. or even you know before that, or even in the 80s, you know. I think it, I think press and publicity and those kinds of things hadn't hadn't become the 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 behemoth that that we now have, which which where where that is the thing, where opening weekend and ad buys and you know how much uh, awareness there is and visibility there is about the film or about you know the story that 
that is much more important now. Also, than comic book fans are nuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, making I, them happy I, I, is... I'm insulted by that. I, take, <laughs> I, I am one, and I take, that, I take umbrage with nuts. <laughs> But, just, but making them happy, and now you see oh, them yeah. rolling out clips at Comic Con a year before the movie comes out, and yeah. trying to get everyone on board yeah. because they can kill a movie if they don't yeah. like it. Yeah, 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 and and that's fine. You know, that's that's that that's their power, and you know, it's an interesting thing. It's um, for, I'm lucky in the sense that I I I just get to do the making, and uh, if I uh, my the thing I struggle with, in all honesty, is is keeping detached from an outcome. Uh, all I can do is do the work and, and devote myself entirely and, and have my life and, uh, and the rest is not up to me. Uh, even though we seem to believe that it is up to us somehow, that we can somehow manipulate and maneuver a reaction out of an audience and, and, and get people to pay. I mean, we can, you know, you know it, it, PR exists. It was invented in the 20s by <laughs> Freud's nephew, if no one knew about it yet. Sigmund <laughs> Freud's nephew created right. PR out of Sigmund Freud's psychological findings. Yes. So, he's min so and we are, we are being and manipulated Matthew constantly. Matthew Freud Communications in New York is right. still, still around. Yeah, But terrifying. I also think audiences have a displaced sense of reality when it comes to the actor's role. Like if a movie's bad, they just blame you, or they, they think that you somehow have final cut. <laughs> right. Well, we are the face. That's right. the that's the scary. That's the tricky thing. And I've been in situations where I, where I where I've had to say to someone, I'm I'm I, you don't understand. Like people are gonna think that this is my fault. <laughs> people are gonna think that I, that I created this. Like right. like like you get to go and like work on something else secretly and privately, right. but it's my face forever associated. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, that's that's the reality. That's that's where we are. That's where my life is, and that's I have to live with it. <laughs> uh, it's a challenge. It's very challenging, though. It's very challenging because I like I like my I like having privacy. I like being just you know. I like I want to. I don't want to have any. I don't want to. I don't want to feel pressured to be anything but than 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 what I am. That's why I think I ultimately became an actor and went into the creative arts. Is because I needed to express myself truly Is it scary to have that sort of loss of privacy right? yes very 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 and i think it's uh, i think that's a that's the hard thing about being an actor of this time is there is a different expectation that uh, um, audiences have um and i think it can get in the way of the work it can and it can shut people down and i know for me my my um my thing is i have to not be shut down because i can get very uh, like a turtle I can get very uh, protective of my life and of my uh, myself, and uh, I have to do that in order to to be able to be in the world and do and do the work that I want to do. I love observing people. I love meeting people. I love being in the world and with people. And 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 I, and I'm a bit. Sometimes I, I I get a bit angry at myself for having created the reality that I've created, where uh, it's it's harder to meet strangers without without um, uh, an expectation. Of or, or um, a kind of uh, an idea. Of, I, I'm not putting this right. Uh, it's I, I, I just I, I, I'm, I get angry at myself sometimes. Um, Don't but be angry. It's not your fault. Hey, let me be angry at myself. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be angry at myself. I'm gonna be angry. At no, no, no. I, that's sweet of you to say. It's but just fame, though, and everyone in this room can. Empathize yeah, but I with chose that, it. I know? did choose it. You did. I, I, I knew it's going gotten out of in, control. We can all agree. I mean, this is it is really a strange become time. Really, but I, but I did know going into Spider Man that my life would change, and 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 that was my main. That was the main thing that was holding me back from ultimately saying yes. That was the only thing, actually, because I knew that my reality would change, but I still, I had to, I had you to know. You did it anyway. <laughs> Touch the, put my hand in the fire. So, uh, yeah. not long after Spider-Man, you made what is my favorite movie of yours, which is 99 Homes. Oh, um, the complete opposite of Spider-Man yeah. in, in every way. Yeah, by um, design. <laughs> just, just all of it, the, yeah. the, the anti-big movie. Yeah. Um, Maureen Barani, which is, um, yeah. who is the director, and about the housing crisis in Florida. Yeah. Um, that's just the very blanket term for what it was, but you you brought it, you made it personal. Mm. I love this story so much, and and this character was very different for you too. Not that we hadn't seen you play sort of like a working class guy, but mm -hmm. I, I thought, now that I didn't think you could, but you so beautifully captured this guy's malaise and mm. but all he's like fighting for the people and wanting to do the right thing. And mm. what what did it feel like to? see yourself doing this kind of project after this juggernaut, did you feel a little less anxious about maybe the control you have in your career? 
Thank you for saying that. Um, I I waited, I waited, I waited while to <coughs> to go to work after the Spider-Man stuff, and um, I did a play. In bet I did Death of a Salesman in New York in between the two Spider-Man films, which was uh, like a healing balm, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, must have been, yeah. Yeah, it was. That was such a uh, incredible with the great, the late great Philip Seymour Hoffman yeah. as Willie Loman, and the late great Mike Nichols directing. Um, <laughs> just the most gorgeous experience of my life, maybe to date. Um, so then, uh, yeah. So then after after the second Spider-Man, th I read this script and I met Ramin and I was so, I was so touched by it. I felt so, if, uh, even though I'd never been through what these people were going through, it, I felt like I had. It felt like it was all of our stories and it felt very universal. It felt very, very of, again, back to the, the people feeling disposable mm -hmm. and uh, a value system that does not place value on the human soul a value system that places value on whether you have uh, an economic uh, uh, ability to contribute mm -hmm. or, or, or status, uh, power, you know, these things. And what happens to those of us who, who feel exiled and discarded? Um, and Ramin taps into that so wonderfully in all of his films, I think. So, and I loved Chop Shop and Man Push Car, which yeah. are other films of his, which uh, if you haven't seen, you should definitely see. They're awesome. very beautiful, humanistic filmmaking, not unlike Arthur Miller. You know, and and Ramin came and saw me in um, Death of a Salesman, actually. Is that how he knew he wanted to yeah, cast him? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And he had never seen uh, a Miller play before. And he, he realized, oh, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. He's a New Yorker, right? He, he is, probably. yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so, so yeah, we, it was... Um, and I had personal connections to it. My, my, my father, you know, we almost went bankrupt. We did go bankrupt, in fact. Um, we al and we almost lost our house when I was a teenager during, during the, you know, that period of time where I was very lost. It was everything, everyone was very That's lost. It's a lot to deal with. It was, yeah, it was a very, uh, it, was, it was the dark time of our family, really. And uh, my, my dad's business fell apart. And uh, so it, it, was an it was an opportunity to heal something there where I, I could feel that he hadn't forgiven himself mm. for certain you know, things that he would have deemed failures on his own behalf, of course. You know, uh, he, was, he was very hard on himself for it. And so we, we would have um, amazing conversations in the pre-production process of that. And then I would ask him about that period of time. Oh, wow. And he would, uh, you know, my dad's amazing. My, my dad's one of those guys that, that that has has allowed his heart to be cracked open as he's gotten older, mm. and he's uh, he's because he, he was a baby boomer, and you know he's he was a very post-industrial kind of uh, you know capitalist mindset. He you know that kind of Donald Trumpian thing, uh, and uh, but he's allowed him he's allowed himself to uh, to get soft, <laughs> and uh, it's a beautiful thing with me. You know, I mean, what a gift. So I got to talk to him about that period of time. That was a big and part. And how it felt for him to yes. feel like he's failed his family. Or yes, exactly. Yeah. And that was a. I, th I think I was carrying a lot of it. Mm. I think we all we all were. The family were carrying a lot of it. So making that film was an attempt to do some healing for personally uh, for my father and me and <coughs> our family and and every single family because every single family goes through something similar. I believe in 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 the the way that our that our world is is that the our world has been set up for us to fail. Right. Um, that the, the system Ameri is not in place to help. No, the American right. dream is a sweet idea. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, a and you got to work with Laura Dern, oh. who's the goddess of all goddesses. Oh my god, you, you love her <laughs> as oh, much I as just, I do. Yeah. I, she's amazing and yeah. has been for like 30 years. I feel like, and I feel like now, yeah. it's taken a long time for people to sort of realize the work she's been doing all this time. She's but so humble, yeah. like so truly humble. Yeah, she is. She doesn't ask for it. She doesn't say, "Look at me." She's she she's and she's such an artist. Like she is such a pure artist in everything that she does, and so generous. Yeah, I can't I can't speak highly enough of of Laura. As and well. she grew up in Hollywood too. And how crazy well adjusted. is that? Yeah. How did how did she <laughs> and manage Bruce Dern's that? Her father. I know. <laughs> Someone had to be sane in the family, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you come from two artists, you know. It's, yeah. it's not an easy thing. Yeah. Um, so I want to make sure we get to, of course, breathe and everyone's questions, but I do want to talk about, you sort of had an amazing double bill last year with Hacksaw and Silence, mm, yeah. <laughs> Mel Gibson and Marty in the same yeah. year. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
and earned an Oscar nomination for Hacksaw Ridge, yeah. which is, again, super impressive. Um, that was a very physically demanding movie. Mm. I, I remember watching it. I always take the screeners home at the holidays and try to enjoy the ones I haven't seen with my family. And mm. I was just, I was so worried for your safety making this <laughs> movie. I mean, were you incurring injuries all day long on set? I mean, this was pretty grueling. Minor injuries. Minor. Uh, so no, not nothing to worry about. Okay. It was, uh, it was grueling and we didn't have much time to shoot it. You shot in Australia, right? 100%. We shot in Australia. Yeah. And Mel Gibson is a genius because he had half the budget and half the time he had well, for, for Braveheart. Wow. And he managed to achieve what he achieved wow. with those battle scenes and also setting up characters that you care about. Um, I, I don't know what, how he does what he does because it's all so intuitive and instinctive. And uh, he, uh, he's so brilliant. He's so smart as well. But his body is so smart. Mm -hmm. There's something about Mel where he can tell, he knows exactly, he makes no notes. Really? He's just, it's all instinctive and intuitive storytelling, like mm -hmm. almost like indigenous. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like right. primal, around a campfire. Well, you did make Apocalypto, which was right. fine. <laughs> yeah, I feel perfect. like if you can make that movie, you can yeah. kind of do anything. But, yeah. he, but he, 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 he gets to the root of, of that classic, mythic, kind of storytelling that just you can't help but it shakes your soul and it gets you closer to yourself and it makes you love other people and I yeah so um so I, I would I, I very very quickly realized that and I, I would I would have I would have done anything really and also you know that character is such a that man Desmond Doss was such a special Very. human being and I think uh he was the kind of person that I would be sad to, to, to leave at work every day, you know? Like, it's that kind of thing where you go, I'm, uh, why can't I just be him? Why can't <laughs> I be as pure as him, be as uh, uh, wise as him? Because it wasn't just, he, wasn't just in a, he wasn't just an innocent. He, was, uh, he had this ancient wisdom, Desmond. Uh, he, he had this awareness of, of, what, what, of our common... Uh, of, of our commonality as human beings, not only as human beings, but he had the say, he was a vegetarian and he right. was a... He was a, ahead of its time, yeah, ahead of yeah, his time. Yeah, he was like Ferdinand ways. the Bull, you know, <laughs> while, while everyone else was, you know, he was just smelling flowers in the, in the battlefield. He was a hippie, essentially. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> This is why hippies don't go to war, generally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I see a lot of similarities between <clears throat> him and Robin in yes. Breathe. Yes, yes. Um, so tell me a little bit about what attracted you to the story. Obviously, we saw the teaser and mm. it's a very compelling story, but I have to imagine the physical part of this role was a little, I would cause a little bit of concern just because acting while being immobile is not easy. Mm. I never saw it as that. I saw it as a living challenge rather than acting challenge. And I thought, well, this is a man that was not always a disabled person. Yeah. This was a man that started out as a non-disabled person. You know, he was uh, very athletic, very physical, very um, <coughs> gregarious, extroverted, um, party thrower, leader, um, captain of the army, very religious, you know, a very spiritual man, um, but uh, very joyful as well. Mm. And, uh, and then at 28, he contracts polio in, in Nairobi and he's paralyzed from the neck down. So, I, so, so his challenge was my challenge. It was like, well, 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 his challenge was how do I live like this? How do I adjust to this? How do I reconcile? Well, first of all, he renounced God. First of all, he was like, well, fuck you. Um, I, I've, I've done my That time. seems a fair reaction yeah. to something like that. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and, and then he was suicidal mm. for about a year. Right. He was depressed for about three. Um, and then ultimately, he decided to be here, to be, to be alive. He had a baby. He, he had, had a baby on, his, on the, on the way when he was right. paralyzed, which added to his agony. You know, the letting go of being able to throw a ball back and forth, letting go of, you know, uh, being able to wrestle in a, in a, in like a, in like the back garden, you know, all those things. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. What did you learn? Um, so Andy Circus, this is directorial debut. Yeah. Someone who knows a little bit about kind of creative. Face acting. <laughs> well, yeah, face <laughs> acting, but also just using the body in clever ways. Yeah. Um, what kind of advice did he give you about this challenge? He. He's amazing, actually. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> Gosh, it's weird having your throat clear amplified. Um, <coughs> we can do it again later if you'd like. 
<laughs> odd sensation. Um, he, he's amazing because obviously he's a wonderful actor himself. And he is so aware of all the different ways that actors go to get to where they're getting to. And uh, so he was very hands off because he had a whole lot of other shit to deal with, you know, right. like making his first movie. Right. And, um, and he cast people that he trusted mm. and he would adjust things if they needed, but otherwise he would let us fly because he, he was very focused on, we, we had an amazing camera um, DP, uh, Bob Richardson, mm. who is legendary and genius. So, so Andy was very, uh, it was a strange thing. We, like myself and Claire Foy, another remarkable actor. She's so wonderful. Um, and again, like someone that, you know, thank God, you know, it was her because otherwise I don't think we would have had much of a movie. Um, she, she made it live, she made it all live. And the connection that we were able to create was a lucky thing. Um, and so, so yeah, he, and I think he, he could feel that me and Claire really loved each other and we were making a dynamic that was very specific <coughs> without even thinking about it. So I think he just was... It was very believable. He let it happen, uh, mm -hmm. which is a mark of a true great director, I think. A confident director who's not feeling left out. <laughs> you know, someone who's like, no, this is, if it ain't broke, and then I'll take the credit <laughs> for it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. that's, that's, that's the beauty of, like, right. Scorsese's the same. He's like, best idea wins, and I take the credit. <laughs> uh, and same with Mel. Like, all these really confident right. directors. It's like, it's, I, I love that. And I love collaborating, and I love being in post as well when I'm allowed to be. And you, strangely enough, it's the ones that the ones that you wouldn't expect to to, to allow me impose. They were the ones that did, like, mm. like Scorsese, like Mel, really? the ones who uh, you know. And, so. and what sort of feedback was Marty open to? Anything, really? Anything, because he knew it was in my bones. He knew mm. that I I I lived I lived it out. He knew that I studied with a Jesuit for a year. He knew that I wow. that I that I was so devoted to his story and to the story of this film that uh, he knew he he trusted that I would have certain insights. Um, about the inner life of the character. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say, you know what, I think the framing's a little off there. I, I mean, like, I'm not going to do that. Right. But I might, but, uh, you know, I might say, I might say let, let, can we talk about this scene and, and this is what was happening on the day. Like in I, terms of editing? Well, I mean, in ter well, yeah, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of inner life and in terms of colours and in terms of trying to make sure that all, but, but then again, I mean, I say that I didn't really give him any notes <laughs> because you know Thelma and him yes, are. Yes, they have a good thing going. Are genius. Yeah. No. Yeah. Did you ask him who he likes better, you or Leo? Or did you <laughs> ask him wait until I did. <laughs> I did ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> well, next question. Next no, question. No, okay. <laughs> no, I no. Of course, I didn't. No, no, of course. Of course. <laughs> You can both exist in very different ways in this yes, world. Yes, plenty of room. Um, what do you think are some misconceptions about you as an actor? Oh, do you well, feel like great. people? I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> do you think people see you as? Because you've played a lot of what I would call virtuous characters, um, <laughs> which is a great. I'm you, compensating you're, for something. Else. You're a very good, kind person. But I wonder, oh. is there part of you who you think, gosh, I'd really love to kind of segue to do something darker or? Do you think you'd have to talk someone into letting me be the villain or let me? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've been interested in that. I've been interested in virtue, I think. I've been interested in goodness and in meaning and purpose and destiny and, you know, connect connectedness and love. I've been interested in, I've been, want, I've been wanting to do those things. I, I haven't... I think there's enough horror <laughs> in, yeah. in the world uh, and in my own head. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to indulge that. Maybe it would be good to express it. Hmm. Um, I, I, I long to go towards the center of things, uh, whatever that means. Um, I think what, it, what that means is uh, the things that are meaningful. And I, tr I think every film that I, every play I've done, every film I've done, asks that question, what are we doing here? And why, and why, why are we here? Mm -hmm. And um, can, can, we, can, we, can we heal? And can we, can we create lives of meaning? Uh, so I think that's what I've been, what I've been drawn to. Um, and I think that's probably gonna change now because I think I'm a bit tired 
and uh, I've done, I've been doing a play in England, and I'm going to be doing it in New York, if anyone's going to be in New York, wow. with uh, Angels in America, yes. which is, you know. We've heard of it, yes. The best <laughs> play ever. <laughs> and, uh, and, I've, and, and that is, again, similar in, in its themes. Uh, it's, so, and I think after that, something different's going to happen. I don't know what, um, but I'm, I'm very tired. And um, <laughs> and I'm excited. It's a tiring time to be alive. I think just it is in general. It is, isn't it? Is, it, it? Is, yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. Team. It is. I think it's overwhelming right now in, in the is. culture. And, and do you also want you know you're obviously you care about the world and what's going on in the world. Do you sometimes too. want to? God, I wish I could be doing something where yeah. I can help More these things. On, but because yeah. I mean, all of us, you of know, course. we're in artistic pursuit, and yeah. I mean, every day I'm thinking, gosh, I really should be writing about important right. stuff. And right. so I do. Yeah. You, do you find yourself jockeying between wanting to pursue yeah. this? incredible career that you've established versus no, I think, migrating to something else. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And I think at best the the work is is when I when I'm when I feel most in the center of what I'm doing, it's of service. Mm. It feels like service. Telling a story and acting and creating art feels like you know, my brother's a doctor, mm. a bastard. <laughs> and uh, the competition so I, has remained. The co yeah, exactly. Alive. And like he's literally saving lives on a day to day basis. <laughs> good for you, Ben. Um, <laughs> But you still have his visor with the ha with the lights. Yeah, he's like just taunting me, and like <laughs> like like fixing people's lungs. Um, Show off. And I'm just like tap dancing, like <laughs> tripping over my own feet. Um, no, so no, but in all seriousness, I do feel that um, art. I need art in my life. I need stories. I need paintings. I need I need to make set. I need to be. I need the world to be made sense of in order to feel welcome here, in order to feel belonging here and my connection to the world and to nature. And art is a, such an important thing for me and I think for all of us really, whether we are, uh, admit to it or not. So I especially feel it with theatre more than anything. When I do theatre, when I was doing this play in London and when I'm going to be doing it in New York, because it's a media and because it's a direct transmission and, you know, Roy Cohn, mm -hmm. Is Donald was Donald Trump's mentor? Yes, of course. So yeah. we, the, the, I can't think of a better play that is a march. You know, like it, it, doing that play feels like you're doing a march every night uh, for for human rights and for sanity and for love and for compassion and empathy, and uh, it's uh, very very powerful. You can feel it. It's like a transmission. And movies do that too, obviously. Um, so, so I think being in New York and performing that there yeah. and just knowing, you know, yeah, it's at best it feels of service. But yeah, of course, I, 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 I think I'm thinking about it right now. I think maybe I won't. I don't. I don't know what I'll do after the play. Maybe I'll, uh, you know, I'll do something different. I don't know. I'll take a vacation. Yeah, I probably will do that. But but <laughs> but, but 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 there is there there is definitely a, I share your feelings that longing yeah. of uh, wanting to be a part of the healing, wanting to be a part of the world turning forward and um, you know ending the madness but creating creating a new reality creating a new future creating you know imagining because it's, it's dying we're dying the west is dying yeah. capitalism is dying it's all dying and this is this feels like the last the, the death throes of a right, dying which is why it's so dramatic yeah mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ugly and violent right. um, so we need to let, let it die and it's going to be painful and horrible as it has been and will continue to be. And, but in the meantime, we have to be I feel like we have to be imagining a new structure, a new system, a new way of interacting and creating right. community. And a system that actually reflects the new reality, that isn't yes. trying to, it's this disparate <coughs> thing of old versus new that's just not. Yeah. Not viable. But I would say wh wh where, I'm, where I'm drawing most hope and inspiration is ancient cultures. Indigenous cultures who, um, uh, if, if you do a little bit of reading ab about the ab Aboriginal people mm. or, or, or the, 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 Na the Native American people, there's, that's, that's, living with, that's living wisdom, that's living with wisdom in accordance with nature. Look at Avatar, for Christ's sake. You know? <laughs> I was just thinking about Avatar the other day. Like, he's created a masterpiece and he's created something that harks back to ancient indigenous wisdom and has uh, kind of symbiotically tied it to modern technology. 
uh, I don't maybe James Cameron has the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's probably always thought that he did, by the way. <laughs> Ooh, burn. <laughs> he said he's king Ouch. of the world. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> but but that I love, but I think, but yeah. I think there's something in it. I think there's something in it. And now we segue to audience questions, and there are so many good ones. Um, Morgan has a question for you. Mm. Morgan says, when was the moment you knew that you were quote, wow, I, I'm doing exactly what I love. Mm. What is a highlight or mind-blowing experience that you've had? You've <laughs> probably touched on them at some point or maybe not. No, um, wow, I'm doing exactly what I love. When did that happen? Has it happened yet? <laughs> <laughs> Just on this stage today, you have yeah. this thought, I know. <laughs> um, when did it happen? It's definitely happened. Um, ooh, got it. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> it was at drama school. I, where's, is Morgan here? Yes. I feel like I need to say it to Morgan. Hello, Morgan. Mm -hmm. Hi. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at drama school, and I was, uh, we were doing an Arthur Miller play. We were doing All My Sons. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I wasn't playing Chris. I wasn't, I was playing the neighbor, the doctor neighbor. You know, we, we, we were all cast out of type. Mm. And uh, I was playing the doctor neighbor, who was in his, I think, late, late 40s. And uh, I remember being in rehearsals and um, I was watching other scenes being rehearsed, the Chris scenes. And it was a scene between Chris and his dad. Uh, I forget the character's name. Uh, it's, the, it's the key, it's the core relationship in the play. And I, I, I remember, every, I just, I fell apart. I just totally fell apart watching the scene being rehearsed. And um, I, that's, that was the moment uh, when, uh, after the scene was done and the director the, and, the, and the director was going and talking to the actors and I was just hearing listening to them pick apart the scene and the dynamic between them and I was just sat on the side of the just crying my eyes out and then they did it again <laughs> I was just and I was just like this I want to do this forever I want to do this forever and ever and ever I want to work with this kind of writing I want to I want to get to the core of what we're doing here because Arthur Miller somehow got to the fucking core of of what it is to be a human being and uh as an actor to get to to get to attempt to inhabit that is uh yeah, that was the moment. That was one of the first moments where I was like, "Oh shit, this is what it I get it. This is it." All those Tom Hanks movies and everything and like, "Oh my god, this is this is why we need stories. This is like, you know, when you get conscious of something, when something aligns. So yeah, that was a, a great moment. It's a good one. Very good. Um, Jesse, where's Jesse? Oh, there. Hello. Jesse would like to know, did the movie Silence <laughs> impact you spiritually as you portrayed a person so forcefully denying his faith? And also, were any of the scenes shot in Japan? <clears throat> All in Taiwan, strangely. Um, but the landscapes are very beautiful and could double easily. Very lush. Yeah. yeah. Um, it did change me spiritually. I, did, I studied with a, a wonderful Jesuit priest called Father James Martin, who's a stunning man. He just wrote a book called Bridging, Building a Bridge, which is about how reparations need to be done between the Catholic Church and the LGBTQ community. Mm. And it's wow. a cool book. It's a really beautiful book. He's getting a lot of heat from it <laughs> on both sides, weirdly. Like really? one side is saying, how oh, the blasphemy, and the other side is saying, this isn't enough. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's there just holding <laughs> like, a, like, the, like a true man of God. And he's, and he's, he's weathering the storm. And is it's he American? amazing. He is. Yeah. He lives in New York. He's a New oh. Yorker, yeah. Wow. Yeah, Jim, Jim Martin, follow him on Twitter and all that stuff, he's, he's beautiful. And so I studied with him, I had the privilege of studying with him for a year. And uh, whether I liked it or not, he, uh, he converted me somewhat. Hmm. Um, yeah, he, uh, because he's a true man of God, he's, he's not, you know, he's no charlatan. And, you know, I, I, I learned a lot about Jesus, you know, who, who, who had previously just been a joke to me. You know, j j the idea of Jesus, I, you know, I never really... In, uh, because I, I only really absorbed all, all of uh, the bastardization of, of what you know, his life was mm -hmm. and the manipulation and the uh, misrepresentation of this particular person. Um, and you look at what, what's written down, you look at what he did, and it, it's, it's Desmond Doss. It's, uh, 
it's, uh, it's choosing, it's, it's Mahatma Gandhi, it's Martin Luther King, it's, it's John Lennon, it's, uh, it's just choosing, it's, it's choosing to live a life of, of love and, an, and under the awareness that we are all one, that we are all connected. It's really that simple, do unto others. So I, I, got, I got given a very pure kind of uh, transmission of, of uh, the Christian faith and it was a very, very beautiful thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, thank you. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And this is from a different Jesse, Jesse with an E, who would like to ask, what has been the most difficult and rewarding part of tackling Pryor and Angels in America? Mm. The difficult, the, uh, I'll do the difficult first. Uh, it's the length. It's the seven and a half hours of dying of AIDS. And uh, it's uh, doing that every night is um, the hardest thing I'll ever do, definitely. I'm, I, won't, I won't ever do anything uh, acting wise as, as challenging as that. Um, it's a spiritual, emer it's seven and a half hours of a spiritual emergency. And uh, feeling like any moment you, you, your life could be taken uh, because you have no immune system. Um, I think the anguish of that and I think the, uh, the, the, the injustice and the horror of, of what these men were going through at this time, holding that feels like a tremendous responsibility, a uh, privilege mostly. So I would say that was probably the, 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 greatest, the greatest part of it and the hardest part was, is, because I will continue to do it for some strange reason, <laughs> um, is holding the, uh, that quilt, you know, that quilt, that fucking quilt. <sighs> Ooh, God, I didn't want to cry. Um, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, there's a quilt, um, an a it's called the AIDS quilt, I think, and uh, it's this beautiful, massive um, tapestry, and they, there was one time where they spread it out in Washington, D.C., where the monument is, and um, it was all the, all the people that, that, that lost their lives in the AIDS crisis, and um, it's the most beautiful piece of art you'll see. There's a wonderful film. Oh, fuck, sorry. Um, okay. Called Common Threads, which is a documentary. Really good. Have you seen? Yeah, 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 with Bobby McFerrin music in it. <laughs> oh my god. It's really good. And um, so that I think it's is so um, tangible too. Yeah. You have this living, you know. Yeah, like a monument. Yeah, it's a monument. <sighs> so yeah, that I think is the 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 privilege of doing the play, and uh, the hardest thing because. It's never going to be enough. You know, you know, you know that it's never going to be enough. Oh! But think about how many people walk away from those performances having an insight into this that they didn't before. Mm -hmm. So if you multiply each of yeah. those, I mean, that's you know, oh. kind of a no, it's, it's a privilege. It's a privilege yeah. to do it. It's a privilege to do it. Well, we're glad you're doing it. Me too. I'm very lucky <laughs> to be doing it. So lucky. Uh, next is from Chelsea. Um, she would like to know, what is your process when you receive a script? Mm. How do you break down the character and the analysis of the story? Yeah. Um, oh, 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 in terms of working on it. Um, yeah, I mean, I love that period. That's my favorite period. Of when you finally get the script, right? Yeah, <laughs> if you give it to me. Um, it's that waiting for the script that's <laughs> the worst part. Yeah. Um, so I... I have no set rhythm. I have no set routine. It's mm. always different. It always feels new. It always feels like the first day of school for me. Mm. I always, I never know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, 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 have, I have a really, I, I should mention, I have a, I would like to mention, I have a really wonderful acting teacher here in LA and she, they're in New York too, Sandra Sika and Greta Sika. I don't know if anyone knows these. I've heard of them. Geniuses. Yeah. <laughs> they are um, remarkable teachers and uh, remarkable beings. And uh, I, I, I lean very heavily on them when I, when I get a script. We, we, I like having someone to work with. I like, I, if it's just me on my own, I'll, I'll, I'll make terrible choices and I'll, um, I'll <laughs> go down the wrong path and I'll go a bit mad. 
But um, I, I have a, a wonderful process that I do with, with either one of those wonderful people. And, and they sort um, of help you cheat a little bit. Yeah, it's a total <laughs> cheat. Yeah, it's all their work. I'm just like, I'm just like the front man of right. their work. Um, no, it's like, it's, it's, they have this amazing technique where, it, where they, they get you in touch with your inner self, basically. Mm. And uh, all of the, you know, the idea that you will, like, that you were meant to play this part and you better do it from that unique place inside of yourself, as opposed to attempting to do what you think someone else might do, or what an audience might want, or what you know, a conventional choice might be. Um, it, it's all about coming from the, the truest place in yourself, your creative self, your creative source. Mm. So there's a magical thing that, that, that happens where they bring you down into who you are, and how you and the character meet. Um, and saying that, I do love doing, you know, especially with a play, units and objectives and intentions and actions and, um, and I, animal study. I like doing it using animals to create different characters or work on different characters. Um, I, l I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, love, I love the craft of acting. I love reading books. I like, I like Uta Hagen and Stella Adler. And, I have an amazing movement teacher called Vanessa Ewan that I studied with, and uh, I, I just, I, I, I also like Japanese theatre, like working with these amazing Japanese actors in um, silence. There's this one actor in particular called Yoshi Oida, who has a couple of books that were on my shelf at drama school, so I got to then wow. work with him in this film. Um, it's called The Invisible Actor, one of the books that I had. So. It, um, I like I like drawing from uh, any I like drawing inspiration from uh, from from lots of different places and I, I I I love that it's there's no getting there there's never any getting there it's always it's always a journey towards some moment of truth or some you know unique choice hmm. so you make use of all your resources I suppose so yes. yeah <laughs> I'm kind of obsessive seems yeah. very thorough yeah it's obsessive <laughs> it's my dad's fault it's my father's no, fault no it's he yeah. taught you how to be prepared hey, right. Yeah. Remember when Denzel won his first Oscar? He said, "I may not be the best actor, but I'm the most prepared." And I always that has always oh, stuck. I'm not an actor, but but I always I feel like that's a good. I dig that. Yeah, that's good. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Even he is also a really great actor. <laughs> he is. So it's a little <laughs> false know. humility, maybe. It, it is, but I also, and maybe that was you know that was a few years ago, but it's still that that's a great advice. I love I that. It's really I love that. Advice. Yeah. Um, this is from Marla, and she would like to know if you have it's a great question. Any plans to write or direct? Yeah, I do. Mm. I, I'm, I'm starting to develop things, and there are certain, certain projects and certain, you know, I think, and I think as a reaction to the time we're in, as a reaction to the world as it is now, I, I, I think uh, I only want to make things that I feel the world needs or that I want to see in the world. And uh, sometimes you can't, I can't depend on those things just arriving on my lap. <laughs> like I, and, and also, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the creative process mm. with writing and more directing than writing, I think. I'm, I don't know how good I'd be at that. I don't know how good, good I'd be at directing, but I'd, I'd like to give it a crack at some point. Maybe your dad can write something for you. He has. <laughs> 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 I had a sense that he might be angling for you to help him get his, his first script made. <laughs> he finally likes me. He finally <laughs> wants to hang out. Uh, <laughs> what's his story about? Can you tell us? No, no, no. No, oh, okay. no, no, no. It's one of, it's under lock and key. It's like okay. it's like the new Star Wars, you know. You <laughs> no information about the new Richard Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> he has a great writerly name. Yeah, Richard and, Garfield. and remember the guy who wrote King's Speech, he had just started writing later in life and You're he right. won an Oscar the first year. You're so right. Not gonna happen with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> He'll keep trying. The fact that he's doing it at all yeah, is pretty that's it. It's that's pretty special. Enough. That is enough. Um, Amazing. I'm trying to just find a question that we haven't already touched on. Sure. Um, gosh, we've been so comprehensive. I feel like maybe know, maybe we should just I stop ramble. here because we no 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 you do not ramble, <laughs> Andrew. You give thoughtful answers that we all appreciate. <laughs> okay. um, thank you guys for coming. This thank was so guys. special. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah. Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> you do not ramble. <laughs> Rambling and pies. Cry, <laughs> ramble. Rambling and pies, talking without saying something. Oh, right. Yes. No, I think there's I'm no saying substance things. to yeah, it. No, yeah, I think no. There was some substance. There was some, yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Have a great that night. That was lovely. Thank uh -huh. you for joining. Thank you.